now as we continue this little series of messages from the book of Psalms. We come to the eighth in our series entitled The Way of Holiness, and our scripture reading is from Psalm 119, and we're going to read there verses 9 through 16. And you'll find this passage in the Pew Bible, page 512, and there should be a copy of that if you're a visitor in the book and hymn rack in front of you. And for our children who have their children's Bible with them today, it's page 754, page 754, Psalm 119, and we're going to read verses 9 through 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. It's particularly the ninth verse that I want us to focus our attention on on this morning in our series as we think about the way of holiness, how can a young man keep his way pure? There are some sermons that ought to carry a pulpit health warning, and this sermon that you are about to hear, I think, is one of them. And so before I begin it, I want to put parents who are here with teenage children under a vow that you will cross your heart and hope to die but here and now you vow that as you drive home with your teenage children you will not say to them today did you hear what he was saying in the sermon this morning what you may do is turn to your spouse and say did you hear what he was saying in the sermon this morning and uh, perhaps I should ask you to stand here and now in public if you mean to break that vow and as they say in weddings for as much as no one speaketh uh, let us continue because this is a word clearly for young people the psalmist asks the question how can a young man keep his way pure. Now, doubtless, everything that this psalm has to say applies to every single one of us. But as we'll see, the psalmist has a particular reason for addressing young people in this context. The psalm, as you'll see, is divided into 22 different sections, and if you've any kind of modern Bible, you'll notice that these sections all have a heading Uh, If you've a new international version, you'll also see a funny squiggly thing there. That's a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And the reason these sections have these names is because this psalm looks as though it was composed and structured in order to be memorized. And so each eight-verse section, and there are 22 sections, each eight-verse section begins each verse or stanza, as it were, with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet and works through the Hebrew alphabet from the first letter to the last letter. So that if you are in section 3, then you know that the verses are going to begin with the letter Gimel and that's going to be a little prompt to your memory. Students use this kind of trick, don't they, when they're preparing for exams. There is nothing more humiliating to a professor than to walk in to the room with the exam papers 
having given perhaps 50 hours of lectures, and notice that one of his students has reduced this to a single 3 by 5 card, and there are all kinds of little details to prompt his memory. Alas, the memory will go as soon as the exam is finished, but you get the point that there are things that help us to remember. And through the history of the Christian church, there have been many Christians who have taken up this catechism on God's word and sought to memorize it. Uh, I remember reading about William Wilberforce walking through London and encouraging himself by reciting over to himself on his walk the whole of the 119th Psalm. And that certainly made an amazing difference to his life. The psalm makes amazing claims for the believer. It tells us, for example, in verse 23, that even in the midst of a crisis, the person who trusts in God's word can keep calm. It tells us that in the midst of all kinds of afflictions, it's possible to know comfort. And three verses that I think uh, perhaps a little perversely I have loved since the first time I read them that are particularly striking verses if you are a young person, 98, 99, and 100. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies. It gives me more understanding than my teachers and even more understanding than the aged or the elderly. Now, those are three verses to give you fun if you're a teenager and to give you a sense of stability, to know that you can be wiser than your enemies, to know, especially if you're a college student, that spiritually you may well be able to understand spiritual realities in ways that uh, those who teach you are completely blind. And uh, although one needs to say this very carefully, wisdom does not always come with age. Wisdom comes from God's Word. And so in almost every single verse of this psalm, 176 verses, 22 letters, 8 verses under each one of these letters, in almost every single one of these verses, the psalmist is saying, like a metronome, Word of God, Word of God, Word of God, Word of God. And of course, because he's a poet, he uses a variety of expressions. The statutes, the promises, the words of God, the commandments of God, the, the rules of the game, the principles by which you play the Christian life. But in a sense, in this question, the psalmist comes to the heart of the matter, especially if you are a younger person. And this question, how can a young man keep his way pure? How can a young woman keep her way pure? Now, before you uh, fly off into all kinds of thoughts about what that means, it means, in essence attractive it means so to live with God's word transforming your life that whether people actually like it or not there is something almost indeed actually supernaturally attractive and attracting about the way you live your life to the glory of God you and I may have many friends who do not want to pay the price of that kind of lifestyle, but who will never be able to deny that there is an attractiveness about this. There is a beauty. There is, to use the word here, a purity. Purity in the sense of pure gold about the life that we live as God's people and 
he's asking the question, how is it possible for this to be true of a young person? Now, there is a little challenge here, I think, in the language that the psalmist uses. And I want to, if I may, retranslate verse 9 for you the way I think it probably should be translated. I don't think that verse 9 has a question and then an answer. I think verse 9 just has a question. I won't go into the details of why I think that, except to say I'm not the only person under the sun who believes that this is the case. And the question is, how can a young man keep his way pure to guard it according to your word? How can a young man keep his way pure to guard it according to your word? Now, that means, and this is the first thing I want us to see, that means that the word of God is, in a sense, part of my problem. If you're a teenager, let me underline that for you. Because uh, I need to say it in the presence of your parents and your grandparents and everybody else. Because this is precisely what you find. One of your problems is the Word of God. Now, why should that be the case? You see what he's saying. How is it going to be possible for me to keep my way pure according to God's Word? That's, that's part of the problem of my life, especially part of the problem of being reared in, within the context of, of the life of the church and the life of godliness and the word of God and the fellowship of God's people and worship and praise. Some of your friends, if you're a teenager, don't have this problem. It's a matter of total indifference to them, often because it's a matter of total indifference to their parents. But the word of God should be your lifelong guide. And you know one of the things that happens when the Word of God breaks into your life, not least in early life, is it begins to expose to you all the stuff, all the distortions of your heart, the difference between what you know you have been created to be and uh, what it is that you actually are, or are becoming, or even want to be. So this is certainly not a psalm written by a, a head-in-the-sand poet. This has been written by somebody who understands what it means to be within the community of God's people, where the Word of God is cherished, and where... It points to a very distinctive, if gloriously attractive, lifestyle. And uh, not least in the world in which you live as a young person, as a teenager, perhaps as a young college student. You understand that that word has begun to expose the sinfulness of your own heart. That's actually one of the things the Holy Spirit is given to do. I don't, know, I don't know why people are so reluctant to think about this, but Jesus, the Lord Jesus, said he was giving the Holy Spirit to convict people of their sin. And that was exactly what happened when the Word of God broke in on the day of Pentecost. People began to see that the Word of God was creating a burden on their conscience. They were discovering that they had sinned and that they were sinners. Those of you who were tracking uh, last year with Pilgrim's Progress, remember exactly this point made when Mr. Worldly Wise Man tries to draw Pilgrim away from the way of the cross and the way of grace. And uh, eventually he says to him, do you remember? He says, that's a terrible burden you've got on your back. Where did that burden come from? Do you remember the Christian's answer? He held up his little Bible. He said, it came from reading this book in my hand. That's, that's always the beginning. And that's why this question is here. As I, begin to, as I begin to discover God uncovering 
the sin and the failure of my life. I'm, I'm bound to ask this question. And then there's something else. This is something I know as a young person. That if the word of God is going to transform me into this Jesus-like lifestyle, that's bound to produce opposition. I don't care where you are. I really don't care where you are. You can go to a Christian school. But that's no guarantee that if your life is sold out to God's word and to his son, Jesus Christ, you'll never meet opposition. Teachers may try and guard it. But God doesn't make us live in cocoons. And the psalmist has a great deal to say about this. Very frontal opposition, in-your-face opposition. And then the much more subtle opposition. They lay their traps for me, you see. They try to deceive me. They try to draw me in. They malign the gospel that I love. So this is a huge challenge if you're a young person. And not least as you make your way forward into the future and in so many ways settle your destiny in the present. And, uh, and you're living in a world that's calculated to make this even more difficult. I remember coming across something in the 1970s. I mean, I was in the 1970s when I came across it. And I can't remember its date, but I think it's probably sometime in the early 70s when a field director of one of the security organizations in the United States came across a document that had been written by secularists as a strategy for the future. And uh, here were the elements in it. Break, this is the 1970s that I read it, so I'm sure it comes from the late 1960s. Break down cultural standards of morality, promote pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio and TV. Eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship and, quotes, a violation of free speech and free press. Thirdly, discredit the family as an institution. Fourthly, encourage easy divorce. Fifthly, gain control of key positions in the media. Sixthly, present homosexuality and promiscuity as, quotes, natural, normal and healthy. Well, it's here, isn't it? That's the world you're living in. So to be a Christian, teenager, young person, means that by definition, you're swimming against the tide. And there is therefore a sense in which, remember how the prophets spoke about this? The word of God is a burden to me. And it's a burden I cannot bear on my own. That's why the rest of this psalm is really an answer to this question, how can a young person keep his way attractive in order to guard it according to God's word? And we're going to turn to that in a moment. But I do want to say this to you, if you are such a teenager, there are three fatal mistakes you can make. The first fatal mistake is to think it's never been as hard as this. My dear friends, you know that's nonsense. It really is nonsense. Your life isn't under threat, as has been true of teenagers in other parts of the world, many of them in the last hundred years. You're still able to get the finest education. You're not barred from any prospect of getting a fruitful and useful and happy job and making your way in society. Uh, I'm not saying this is the easiest time to live for Jesus Christ, but I am saying it's very far from being the most difficult. So let's not, let's not go around moping and saying, oh, it would be far too difficult to be a Christian. And here's another mistake I could make. I could think there's nobody else facing this challenge. Just look around you. 
in this church. What a privilege those of us who are older, I won't say elderly, but those of us who are older, what a privilege to be in a church where we have so many teenagers and students and, and young people. I believe it or not, my dear younger friends, some of these people were younger at one time in their lives. Some of them were born the way they are today. <laughs> but they know the struggles. They know the call of God. But the greatest mistake I could make would be to think there are no resources to help me. That's why there are 175 other verses in this psalm telling you there are resources to help you. And here's the great thing. The Word of God that to you may actually seem to be part of the problem is actually the very place where God gives us all the resources. And there's something I want to underline for us all today, not just those of us who are younger, but all of us. There is a very important principle is seen in this psalm. Often we read this psalm thinking, now what, what am I supposed to do? There are statutes, there are ordinances, there are rules, there are laws. Just tell me what I'm supposed to do. But actually at the root of this psalm there is this message. Before you do the Word of God, you need to let the Word of God do you. I remember asking about a man I knew slightly in another city altogether in the United States. I had known him a little at a distance. He was a man who exercised some influence. I realized that. You could, you could tell. I said, what does do? And uh, I got a little smile back. And these words, isn't one of the people who does, he is one of the people for whom other people does. You know, uh, some of you are in that position. Till you get home, you're in that position. And we need to understand that with the word of God. Because we are living, my friends, in such an activistic society. And we're living in a church culture in the United States that is deeply influenced by that society where we're always thinking the Bible tells me how to get saved and I need to go to a seminar or a Christian bookshop or listen to a tape or find a guru who will help me to find out what I'm supposed to do. And our greatest need is to understand that God himself through the resources of his word he does it. Listen. He brought creation into being by His Word. He transforms our broken lives by His Word. We first of all need the Word to work upon us and in us and through us. And then within that context, it's not only safe, but it's gloriously possible for us actually to begin to do the Word of God. May I take a moment this morning just to show you that in the New Testament, just to underline for you that this is how the Bible thinks about the Word of God so let's take up our swords, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and just very briefly look at a series of passages, most of which I think will be familiar to you, beginning with Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And if you prefer numbers to books, then you'll find this on page 1003 of the Pew Bible, these very famous words in Hebrews Chapter 4 and verse 12, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrows, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him with whom, to whom we must give account. Now, 
Whatever else that passage is saying, is it saying the word of God has its own power. It doesn't have power because you've decided to obey it. You obey it because it has its power to work in your life. Here's another passage, back a few pages to page 986, I think. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Now, this is undoubtedly one of Paul's very earliest letters. Listen to what he says to the Thessalonians. We thank God constantly for you that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is. Well, what is it really? Well, look at what he says. It is the word of God which is at work in you believers. Now, do you think that way, my dear friends, about the Word of God? Or are you in danger of turning it on its head? That it's first of all, and perhaps last of all, something I've got to do. No, it's first of all, the Word of God working in you, the Word of God at work. So the word is, receive it, let it work in your life. Put your life under its power, under its influence. Another marvelous illustration of this in Acts chapter 6, where Luke, the author of Acts, gives one of his several summaries of where was the church at this point in its earliest history. And he says in Acts chapter 6 verse 7, the word of God continued to increase. Now, we know people in all kinds of churches in Colombia, don't we? I wonder if you've ever asked somebody, how are things in your church? I wonder if a single person has ever said to you, you know, God is blessing us. Oh, how do you know that? Because the word of God is on the increase. And do you see the picture? It's almost as though, it's almost as though we could say the word of God in our services, jumps out of the pulpit beyond the marble and starts running around the church. And God is saying, this is for you, this is for you. I'm shaping you. I'm transforming you. I want to make your life attractive to your fellow believers and even in the world, whether the world hates it or is drawn to Christ through it. I'm going to transform you through my word. This is, of course, exactly what Paul says the word is for. The end of 2 Timothy chapter 3. The word of God, the scriptures, he says, are profitable for teaching, for reproving, for correcting. That is, for transforming and healing and reestablishing and for training in righteousness. Now, notice he's not saying the church should be doing these things. He's saying God's Word does these things. And when God's Word does these things in our lives, of course we can't keep that in. Many of you, I'm sure, have noticed in the parallel passages in Paul's letter to the Ephesians and his letter to the Colossians that when he says in Ephesians, be filled with the Spirit, and that will put a song and a melody into your life in Ephesians 5.18. That's exactly parallel to what he says in Colossians chapter 3. But actually what he says in Colossians chapter 3 is, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And that will put a song into your life. If you want to know how to be filled with the Spirit, what it means to be filled with the Spirit... It means that the Word of Christ so dwells in you and is alive in your life, transforming you, conforming you to Jesus Christ like a, like a great sculptor working on the basic stuff of my life. And by the Word, transforming me, cutting great wedges out 
shaping parts of my life. And all the while the potter has in his or her mind's eye, as it were. They say this, don't they? About sculptors, they see a block of something and they see inside it what they're going to produce. And this is how God uses his word to work and work and work in our lives. I wish the contemporary church would get this because we've almost entirely abandoned it, haven't we? Don't you think? In the contemporary church? Um, I remember in 1971, excuse my anecdotage appearing again, one of the very first privileges I had as a young minister was to look after the recently deceased John R. W. Stott for three days. What a privilege that was. As he, in our church, Presbyterian church, you would expect this, he was given the opportunity of preaching to us for three successive nights for about 50 minutes every night. And people drank it up and he said, you know, he says, they don't let me do that at home. They say, Dr. Stott, your sermons are like fruit pudding with all the fruit taken out. Well, those people would die, think they'd gone to heaven if they could hear John Stott preach again now. What a treat and privilege that was. But do you know the expression he used? I remember very well. He said, sermonettes produce Christianettes. And that's what's happened. You know, we are invited to preach in other places and they'll tell us that the sermon should be between 10 and 12 minutes. Do you think that would really shape your life? Do you really? And haven't you noticed something very interesting? That there has been an increase of dysfunction in living the Christian life since churches dropped the notion that you needed a jolly good dose of the ministry of the Word if this was going to happen. And you needed to be into the Word for yourself and letting it work and listening to it. Not talking back to it, but listening to it. And the tragedy is that we scurry, we scurry around like uh, insects who have been exposed to the light, looking for all kinds of things to solve our problems. I'm just amazed by the number of Christians I've spoken to who are going hither and yon to find a solution to your problem. And, and you, you say to them, eh, is there a living ministry of God's Word you could place your life under? Oh yes, there is. Well, uh, where are you? Well, that's not what I want. But it is what God wants isn't it? That's, that's what we think we're here for. Or not to, not to involve you in my crimes. Uh, if I didn't think this is what we are here for as those who preach and teach the word along with the elders in this congregation, I, I think I would spend more time on the golf course and watching crime programs on television. And I think I would have spent my life trying to find a decent job where I could do something constructive. But isn't this what we find ourselves? And isn't this the glory of belonging to a church family like this, where the Word of God is given prominence? Not because we're a bunch of uh, Presbyterian intellectuals. God save us. There may be worse things than Presbyterian intellectuals. But if that's all that we want to be, God save us. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be transformed by his word. Now, you see, when that begins to happen, you'll notice it's very interesting to see what happens in this little section of the psalm. When that begins to happen... It produces all kinds of wonderful fruit. For example, in verse 10, he seeks the Lord with his whole heart. In verse 11, he stores up the word in that heart. In verses 12 to 13, he starts letting it out and praising God. And in verses 14 to 16, especially verse 14 and 16, he finds living in God's word a delight.
So what had started as an apparent problem ends as a marvelous delight. Now why is he so neurotic about young people there? And this is for all of us. Why does he direct this to the young? Well, because the child is the father of the man. Uh, you are not going to be something in the future. You are becoming your future in the present. And the decisions you make now about how you will employ and be transformed by the word are, statistically speaking, going to be the governing decisions of your life. You can't leave these decisions off to the future because when the future comes, you will already be experiencing the fruit of the decisions you made when you were a teenager. Honestly, my dear young people, I know this. I know it's hard to believe. I find it hard to believe when I look in the mirror. But I was once a teenager. There's another reason why this is important. It's because our sins don't just go away. I have a friend, a very distinguished preacher, who on one occasion was speaking at a conference with the legendary Professor Cornelius Van Til. Now, that name may not mean a lot to many of you. Just imagine that there is, was, well, is today in heaven. don't know if you still get your titles in heaven. But a legendary professor of apologetics uh, in the American church by the name of Cornelius Van Til. And at the question and answer session, the question was, presumably... It gets easier to overcome sin the older you get. My friend at that time was a very young man and probably foolishly allowed himself to answer the question first and said something like, as I can imagine, well, I suppose so. And felt the heat of the almost incandescent Professor Van Til, who of course had lived long enough to know that it doesn't get any easier. And the later you leave it, the harder it gets. So a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap a destiny. Uh, if you're a teenager... These are great years of decision. If you're a young student, these are great years of decision about living for the Word of God, by the Word of God. Now here's a closing question. Uh, do you know any teenagers who have lived this way? If you don't, send me an email and I'll either find a living one or point you to the biography of a dead one. But endless multitudes have lived thus and found endless satisfaction and lives full of attraction because of the Word of God. And then there's this. You know someone who was a teenager and who lived this way. And has promised that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And if no one else in all the world had ever lived this way, he would be quite sufficient to see you through. And his name, need I say, is Jesus. Who in his teenage years grew in stature and in wisdom and in favor with his heavenly Father and breathtakingly in favor with his fellow teenagers. And by God's grace, we can do likewise. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the measure of your resources is adequate to the measure of your challenges that the riches of your grace are more than sufficient for the sinfulness of our hearts and lives. We thank you for...
the many brothers and sisters who surround us today, who in their teenage years committed themselves to this grace in Jesus Christ, that the word of Christ would dwell in them richly and their lives would become a song of praise to their dear Lord Jesus. We pray you would make older ones an encouragement to younger ones, that you would make younger ones who thus receive and live your word an encouragement and a challenge to older ones, that in a most marvelous interchange of your working among us in our families and as your people, there may be a growing purity, a growing attractiveness, that whether outsiders understand it, whether indeed they themselves want it, they could never, ever doubt it. And so we commit ourselves to you for this with thankfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.